All right, last time, it seems to me like a long time ago, uh, we were talking about politics, um, political parties. Uh, let's see who remembers something. Tell me something about this, the, the organization of elections in America that pushes us into the two-party system. It's, there's nothing, there's no law that says only two parties are legal, but there's something about our system that pushes us that direction. Is that too vague? <laughs> you can't look back at your notes and find it. <laughs> at least have paper, so that's, that's progress. <laughs> Nothing? Mary's got an answer, anybody else? What about our system, the system of elections, pushes us into a two-party system? Why for this presidential election? Are we thinking primarily about the Democrats and Republicans? We're really not thinking about the, the Greenpeace Party or the Libertarian Party. They're there, but we're really, they're, they're not serious, you know, thoughts, typically. What about the system does that? All right. You did say it clearly, I just forgot what you said. Oh, okay, that makes me feel better. You remember me saying it. <laughs> We have to Mary tell you all. Please. Um, single member districts, only one person gets to win. Okay, a single member district where only one person wins. Like for the president, only the only the winner gets anything. There's not a the second place guy doesn't become president. That's what it was originally, uh, but now just the first place guy wins. Or in a in a county, the the first place person in the district becomes the county chairman. Second place person gets nothing, right? There are places, uh, and we, there are some like this in America, but it's not as common, where uh, there's four people that are going to get an office, and the top four win, you know, the top four. So, so you might get 18% of the vote, but as long as you're in the top four, you get a seat, which then gives an opening for those, you know, the Greenpeace Party or the Libertarians. They don't have to get first place. They just have to get in the top four. So anyway, that, 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 that structure right there pushes us towards that one-party system because there is nothing for second place. If you don't have a real chance to win, you end up with nothing. All right. Um, is it better to work within a major party or not? And maybe you should say maybe. <laughs> if, you can, if you can handle being in the party. Yeah, if there's one that, that lines up close enough with your beliefs, um, yes. Uh, you should. It's, there's lots of advantages, at least, to doing that. All right. Today, I'd like to completely uh, change directions. Um, <clears throat> very likely, since we, we're going to have several days, um, it'll probably be at the end that we'll, 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 we'll fill in the extra days rather than in the middle. Very likely, we'll come back and talk about some things that might fit better back in this front section, the first half of the class that I don't normally get to, but we'll, we'll wait and uh, get through all the things I, I normally want to get to and then we'll, we'll fill in. So we might come back and uh, hit some stuff that's back there. But today I want to shift gears completely. We'll still talk about government, but now talking about economics. And um, I've got several days here talking about economics, uh, everything from you know, economics in one lesson, which you guys should have mastered by now, to the law of supply and demand. What was that scowl for? <laughs> <laughs> it's not master. <laughs> oh, I've had classes in here that, you know, the, the, the running joke became the broken window. For everything you didn't understand, it was just, well, is that like the broken window? Because <laughs> we uh, couldn't, couldn't get past that. So anyway, I do want you to understand that. That's probably why I have you take all the quizzes and read it uh, outside of class. But we'll talk about it in class. That does two things. It hopefully helps clarify your understanding. And then it lets me ask you questions on test about it. So it's a... We've got, <laughs> we've got to do that. Normally, just the stuff that's lectured on is on the test. So. But no, I do think it's important enough to handle both places. And it really is, like the book says, if you can understand that one thought, you'll come down on the right side of everything. You don't have to uh, think in terms of uh, complicated um, terms, and, you know, macroeconomics and microeconomics and supply and demand and, uh, you know, um, inelastic uh, supply. You don't have to think in those terms. Apply that lesson, and you'll, you'll be on the right side of, of, of the issues and not have to know all the complicated things. So anyway, we will talk about some of the complicated things, but that one lesson, if you remember nothing else, just remember that lesson, and you'll be ahead of 
85 or 90 percent of members of Congress who uh, look at uh, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan and think, well, obviously, the U.S. government should give them $115 million or whatever they're thinking about giving them. This, obviously, that should happen, right? <laughs> Joy's with, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so you can look at that situation and uh, think about all the groups involved, not just the residents of Flint, Michigan. Do you, are you familiar with the water crisis in Flint, Michigan? They, the the munici municipality there, there's all kinds of lead in the water, so they're, they're trucking in b trucks of water and bottled water because they can't drink it. And Anyway, um, so you can think about all the groups involved, think about the long-term consequences, and uh, come out against it, but we'll be there. All right, today, though, as far as economics, at least to get us started, um, I'd like to talk about some biblical principles. Rather than, we're not going to... Um, Depending on the time, we will start into economics in one lesson a little bit. But just want to think through the Bible, and there, there are lots of principles that bear on economics. Um, and I'd like to just have a list of them. This is not, I've got 15 things here, but I, I don't think it's exhaustive. But just a, there, there really is a lot there as we think about it. Let's start, though, with a definition. And I think a, a, a good definition will help us see how the economics is much more than uh, the balance almost dated myself in your checkbook, the, uh, the balance, um, what do you call it on, you know, your, on, your vid, on the screen when you, when you log into your bank? Uh, it's, it's much more than keeping track of the balance there. Oh, I'm sorry, that's antiquated too, on your smartphone right? uh, when, you, when you go to look. So. All right, definition. <clears throat> the study of how people make choices among available alternatives in order to continuously increase their welfare. The study of how people make choices among available alternatives in order to in continuously increase their welfare. <clears throat> um, I'm not taking a lot of economics courses, but a lot of them start with really just analyzing the way people make decisions. Uh, things like, um, why did you get up this morning and get dressed, eat breakfast, and come to class, as opposed to uh, get up, eat breakfast, go back to bed, you know, <laughs> go to the dunes and watch the ice melt, you know, as opposed to some other thing. Why did you come here? All right. And the, 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 the short answer is, well, it was better for you. It increased your welfare. There's, making this choice was better than the alternative choices. All right. So... So if you think of that here, we're really, we're talking more just about dollars and cents. A lot of it does focus on what you do with your money. You know, why, why did you, um, um, I don't know, why did I buy used tires for my car this week as opposed to new tires for my car this week? Well, you know what, need that definition again? Oh, come on. You didn't listen to anything I just said, right, because you needed the definition. Uh, the study of how people make choices among available alternatives <clears throat> in order to continuously increase their welfare. <clears throat> There's a, a, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, I'm going to write down, but uh, economists talk about self-interest and how people make decisions based upon their own self-interest. Don't think they're necessarily a sinful self-interest, but uh, you go to work, uh, not because you love everybody who wants to, <coughs> can't remember where anybody works, I, I don't know, you work at a restaurant, right? I forget. Around the clock. I was there yesterday for lunch. Really? I had the um, the Sunday pie. The, oh, the roast beef Sunday. The roast beef yeah, Sunday. Amazing. It was really good. You guys should go there and try it. <clears throat> it was good. Uh, someone else had the grouper special. Oh, yeah, it looked really good too. I'm sorry. <laughs> she goes to work. Uh, she's not there because she just loves seeing people smile and eat a good meal. What's that? They don't smile. <laughs> See there? That's not why you're there. You're there because you want a paycheck. It's in your self-interest. Okay? And if you ever get to the point where you say, no, I'm just there because I love serving humanity, just <laughs> tell your boss you don't want to check and see how often you show up. Right? I, I, uh, I joke with my wife sometimes how enjoyable it is to go split wood for, to burn in my fireplace. But for the three and a half or four years that I didn't have a wood stove, I never split any wood. Because there was no money involved. I wasn't saving any money. I didn't just go out for fun and split firewood. <laughs> now that I'm burning wood and it's saving me money, it is, it, it's enjoyable. So it's in my self-interest to go do that. So, so anyway, lots of times economists talk about self-interest and don't, don't think they're sin nature necessarily. But we, 
We do things to increase our own welfare. All right, so here, the study of how people make choices among available alternatives in order to continuously increase their welfare. So that includes a whole lot more than just dollars and cents and ledgers and things of that nature. So, All right, now let's look at a, a list here of uh, just some principles or ideas from the Bible that bear upon how we make choices among, alter uh, among alternatives. All right, the first point is God created the world for us to have dominion over. God created the world for us to have dominion over. We talked about that when we got to environmentalism a little bit. It, it, it's here for us. All right. uh, I think we talked about shooting Bambi and eating her, or shooting Bambi's father. You know that. What's that? I don't know. I'm kind of glad. <laughs> Is Bambi a guy? Yes. Frank's saying no. <laughs> He was a tweaky guy if he was a guy. Okay, I'm sorry that. <laughs> uh, where are we at here? But th those, those animals are there for us to eat. All right? we, are, we are allowing them to fulfill the ultimate purpose of, the, of God in their life when we eat them. A fox or some other animal could eat them. They're there for us. But anyway, I'm kind of joking. But God created the world for us to have dominion over, so it's not wrong to cut a tree down and use it or kill an animal and use it or... Uh, mow down the rainforest and build a house. Right? That's not wrong. Right? We shouldn't abuse. We talked about that before. But God created the world for us to have dominion over. All right, second thing. And these are not in any special order, just a, a listing of them as I came up with them. Uh, debt is something to be feared. Debt is something to be feared. Debt. Death is something to be maybe feared as well, but uh, debt is something to be feared. Okay, I have a list here of four things to think about with debt. Uh, first of all, it's always associated with bondage in the Bible. Um, I'll just read you one verse, Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Over and over, that idea of debt and uh, bondage are associated. Now, I do not think, I, I intentionally phrase debt as something to be feared. I don't think it's something that's sinful uh, to go into debt for, but it is something you should be very, very careful with and only do when it's absolutely necessary. There's, uh, I think, a, a very small list of things that you should possibly go into debt for. So, associated with bondage. Another thing to think about with debt here, as far as it being something to be feared, is that it, uh, it can prevent mobility. Right? If you're in a bunch of debt, uh, it's really hard to do things. You imagine if um, you have, uh, I just heard this morning about a college that uh, the, the four-year average, I think it was $100,000 to attend, which isn't that high, actually. <laughs> uh, but imagine getting done with college and you got $100,000 of debt, and um, hopefully not here, and God wants you to be a pastor at some little small church in the country. It, Unless you're going to grow illegal substances in the cornfields <laughs> to pay off your debt. You can't go and do that. Right? It, 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 it prevents you. It, there, it stops you from being able to freely move. It prevents mobility, especially if you're trying to follow God's will. If you get into a bunch of debt <clears throat> needlessly, uh, you're going to hinder your ability to follow God's will. Right? Third thing is it presumes on an uncertain future. Presumes on an uncertain future. It's fun and aggravating and, you know, maybe frustrating all at the same time to go into an appliance store or someplace or maybe, uh, you know, the computer section at Walmart or someplace and they've got all the, I don't know if Walmart so much, but uh, Staples or someplace. They don't so much, a lot of places put the price up as a monthly payment, you know, only $50 a month, you know. <laughs> and it's easy to read that and say, oh, $50 a month, I can come up with that, that's no big deal. My, my suggestion is to... Uh, Save $50 a month and come in and pay cash. Right? That all of a sudden is like, oh, maybe I can't save. It, it, it changes the whole thing a little bit. But you're, when you go into debt, you're assuming you're always going to get that same amount of money. You're presuming upon that. Jacob's laughing. Is this a firsthand experience? Or, uh, don't, have to tell, don't answer that. You're assuming that nothing's going to change in the future. Right? Imagine you, know, you, you buy all these gadgets that you need and then you, you lose your job. The, Round the clock decides they, they want somebody else there. You have too much joy. Uh, and then you don't have a job. 
And what do you do with all those things? You know, how those payments all of a sudden become monstrous, right? You're much better off to save that $50 a month and go in and pay cash as to, uh, to go into debt. So it presumes upon an uncertain future. And then the last one, kind of two things together. It uh, may interfere with God's protection or God's provision. Kind of two sides of the same coin. There might be a reason that God didn't give you enough money to buy the, the, um, the street rod motorcycle, the ninja or something like that. Right? Because you would, you would be dead. <laughs> Uh, there, there, God might not give you money for certain things because he, he knows it would be bad for you. And you go out and borrow money and put yourself right in a position that God was trying to save you from by not giving the money. Or God might be ready uh, to, to give you a great blessing. And you go out the day before and borrow a bunch of money. And then and the next day after you incurred all this debt, somebody offers you the thing for free. I feel kind of stupid at that point. So uh, There's been a couple of times, we weren't going to borrow money, but several times we were saving money once for a stove and we needed a mattress and then a, a laptop and several things. And we were shopping and trying to figure out what we wanted and, and out of the blue, one was dropped, on, not dropped, but <laughs> given to us, all right? And uh, for, for about a year and a half, we started joking about, well, let's start shopping for this next and see, see when somebody gives that to us. It was, we need a stove that was given to us, and we needed a mattress that was given to us, and then a laptop, and that was given to us. And that's as far as it got, but it took about 18 months. But God might be ready to give you something, and you go out and get a whole bunch of debt and buy it yourself, and you, you miss the, the great blessing. So the whole point is debt is something to be feared. It's, it's, you don't want to enter into it lightly. Um, be very, very careful. So. All right, uh, third uh, principle. We have the world's here for us. That's something to be feared. Uh, third thing is we are individually responsible for our lives. We're responsible. If you, um, if you can't pay your school bill, it's your problem. You know, really, you should get a better job, do something. You're the one responsible. If I can't... Um, if I can't feed my family, you guys need to pay more. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> I'm kidding. Then it's my problem. I need to figure out what I'm doing wrong and uh, look at my budget and adjust things. It's my problem. All right, so individual responsibility. Salvation works this way. We don't get saved as a group. Congress can't pass a law and say, all right, everybody's saved in this collective thing. It's an individual thing. And economically, we are individually responsible. A whole lot of our system undermines that completely. And you can probably... Uh, think of things that undermine it completely. The whole welfare system undermines it completely. The whole, uh, now the Obamacare, that whole package undermines it completely. There's no individual responsibility. Insurance companies have to provide you coverage no matter your condition. That, that, that still boggles my mind that re Republicans gave up fighting. That, the, the, the insurance companies are now enforced to cover pre-existing conditions. Have you heard that phrase before? You, you, you get diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure, and then you go see an insurance company to, to get health insurance. They have to provide you health insurance. Right? It's literally like wrecking your car, then going to get insurance, and then having to fix your car that got wrecked before you had insurance. It's literally the same type of thing. But anyway, there's no, th th it strips away that individual responsibility. Instead of you thinking, I better get some insurance now while, while I'm healthy and before I have all these problems, strips away. So anyway, individual responsibility, that is, um, that is a biblical idea. Uh, and as a country shreds that, it has problems and we're going to experience that. All right, it also is a major difference between uh, conservatives and liberals. I mean, uh, you know, if you listen to Bernie Sanders, once you get past all the crazy gestures and the hair, um, <laughs> If you listen to him speak, he's talking about how we want to give everybody free college tuition. And, you know, instead of, instead of saying to young people, if you want to go to college and be an engineer, I hope you work hard and save your money in high school and go pay for it. You say, no, 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 we're going to give it all to you for free. It's all, you know, it undermines it completely. A true conservative position much more emphasizes the individual responsibility. So not that conservatives in the Bible necessarily always line up, but in this case, they do a little bit. All right, so individual responsibility. A fourth one is the family unit was created by God 
and, and the family unit as God created it, not the, the family unit that the Supreme Court <laughs> dictated. Husband, wife, children, that is an institution created by God. And if we, if we throw that thing out, there's going to be mass chaos in society in, in all kinds of places, but also financially. I mean, think of, hopefully, you can think of things you learn from your parents about how to take care of your money and how to save and how to work hard. Um, and if that family structure gets destroyed, uh, a lot of that gets lost. The same, the same type of thing we think of socially in other places with the family unit being destroyed also happens here in the financial world. So the family unit created by God. Uh, the fifth one is human imperfectibility. Us guys in the room are thinking uh, at least no more than, than we've established. And we're perfect, <coughs> but no more. <laughs> Come on, Megan. Uh, human imperfectibility. We can't, we can't have a perfect situation on earth. Uh, that's something else liberals will often do. They'll, they'll describe uh, nirvana, this perfect situation, and then look at America and say, look, America is not perfect. <laughs> okay. You're right, America is not perfect. Uh, and it's never going to be. So if somebody comes along and sells you that story, you know, if we, if we do this, get this law, then it'll erase all of the social tensions and everybody will be happy and nobody will be sick and all the cats will, will, will not have fleas or whatever, you know, <laughs> perfect. Uh, you don't even have to listen or analyze the, what they're selling you. It's false. It just, it, it can't happen. All right. Human imperfectibility cannot be that way. That ultimately it's because of our sin. It's our sin nature that, that has given this, this condition on earth. Uh, we worked originally in the garden. It was a perfect setting. And we sinned and destroyed it. So there's nothing, um, nothing we can do to create a perfect situation. And then kind of in the same vein, um, manipulating our environment is not going to make us better. Right? Lots of times people... We'll say, yeah, oh, you know, that kid grew up in a neighborhood where there's drugs. Okay, not, not that that's a good influence, but just taking that kid to a neighborhood where there's no drugs isn't making that kid perfect. It's going to have the same sin nature. Right? You could point maybe back to uh, the kid grew up in a bad neighborhood and uh, his family was split up and, you know, that type of thing, major destruction. But anyway, uh, just changing our environment doesn't make us perfect. We still have that sin nature. Uh, to me, probably the most well-known person in history that thought uh, change in the environment would make things perfect was Karl Marx. He thought if we got rid of all private property, then it would get rid of all, there'd be no wars, no fighting, no theft. That doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. So human imperfectibility. All right, now, number six is that God expects us to work. Can anybody think of anything in the Bible that points us in that direction? Hmm. Yeah, that was pretty straightforward. <laughs> kind of important. Eating is important. Uh, I might have told you the story. There's a, and it, uh, I forget. Six or eight years ago during the election time, I was uh, went over to hold a sign in Porter. It was the year that... Uh, um, we, we uh, increased the budget for the public schools in Chesterton because they weren't getting enough money. <laughs> it was just insane. Um, anyway, I was holding a sign against this raising our property taxes to give the schools more money. I forget the numbers. They were already getting 13 and some thousand. It was going to bump it to 14,000 per student. Um, but anyway, I was holding a sign over there uh, against this thing. And there's a guy beside me that, that didn't work. Uh, lived in you know, a little apartment, got money from the government on disability. And he was just telling me, well, I, I can't stay in one place for eight hours at a time. You know, just at, uh, I just can't do it. There's something wrong with me. And he was explaining his disability. I said, what if the government didn't give you money? And he said, well, I guess I would figure it out. <laughs> he wanted to eat. Right? He, wanted, he knew he had to eat. Anyway, that's something God expects. All right, God expects it from us. And I know we might look at life and say, man, if I could have a figure, if I could win a lottery and never have to work again, it would be great. It really is just kind of miserable. If you've ever gone on a good vacation where you just 
you had a lot of fun, you know, your whole day's involved around which restaurant are we going to and what hike are we taking. At the end of that, you start to feel kind of useless. And you think, oh, it's good to come. I want to come back and do something real, right? Because that is it's part of her nature. I enjoy a good vacation. I just came back from one. But it was good to come back and uh, get back to work because it is something that God, God instills in us that we need to work. So, um, oh, One other little side note here. Uh, man collectively not working causes poverty. You see somebody that's poor. Now, there, there are other factors involved, but uh, usually at the heart of it is they're not willing to work. A free market system uh, is amazingly good at giving people incentives to work as opposed to a socialist system where people that uh, don't work are just given money. All right, it's just like that guy that said he would figure it out. In a free market system, if you're going to eat, you've got to earn the money, and it, it gives us great incentive to work. But anyway, it, poverty comes when we don't work. All right, number seven uh, in our list of biblical principles, we are stewards to God. Stewards to God. Now here we're specifically talking about financial things and more material things, but our, I mean, our whole life, we're, we're stewards to God for everything. You know, every day of our life, every minute, uh, we are responsible to God for what we do. But also with our things, right? You know, you get your paycheck. Uh, hopefully at some point, God flashes through your mind about what, what does God want me to do with this? Maybe not in those words, but hopefully you look at it and think, okay, I need to, need to give something to the church. I should probably do something for my ministries. You're thinking of the ways God would want you to spend. Don't forget to add there, pay my school bill, you know, some of those things. Um, you're responsible to God. You're going to give an account to God for that money. So we are stewards to God even for our money. Think of somebody that you uh, respect and fear a little bit, maybe your dad or, you know, somebody, a grandpa or somebody like that that you fear. Imagine having to uh, take your financial records to them and explain to them what you've done with your money for the last six months. Right. Some of us might grimace a little bit and say, wow, that wouldn't be too much fun. <laughs> we are at some point going to take our financial records to God <laughs> and explain to him what we've done. We are, we are stewards to God, even for our money. So, All right, uh, number eight, you reap what you sow. Often we, we talk about sin and we reap the consequences of sin, but the same thing here in finances. You reap what you sow. Um, I have a little, just a little dash there that it's not wrong to make a profit. Right? I mean, Hillary Clinton and others talk about you know, the excessive profits of the oil companies. and She once said that we want to take the excessive profits of the oil companies. And say, it's not, profit isn't wrong, it isn't evil. Um, you can just look at the way God organized nature. You plant a seed and you get back a whole lot more than one seed. It'll look kind of funny to have a, a corn stalk and at the top is one kernel. <laughs> we get nowhere, all right? But we get, all, we get ears, we get hundreds of kernels, uh, that idea of profit. So anyway, it's not wrong. It is something God built into the world. And as long as we're not sinning to make that profit, really the sky's the limit. You know, if um, Jacob's in front of him, if he comes up with some great product and everybody in the country is willing to pay him money for it and he, you know, he's got $10 billion in the bank. We shouldn't look at Jacob and say that he's stupid and evil because of that. I mean, there are other reasons, that, but not because of, I'm kidding. No, because he made a lot of money, it's not evil. Now, if he loves the money, there's a problem. Or if he uh, commits fraud to, to get the money <laughs> or uh, hires a bunch of thugs to go beat up the employees of his competitors, there's problems. Right? But the profit, there's nothing wrong with that. So profit is not wrong. And again, if you think, if you're starting to doubt that, just think about uh, the product that you sell to your employer, your time. You want to make a profit, right? And you don't feel guilty getting your paycheck. So, all right, uh, you reap what you sow. Uh, next to number nine, God commands us to tithe. We're told to tithe. That's all I have. We're supposed to tithe. It's not a not a give or take. We're commanded to tithe. Number ten, God commands us to love one another. Even Jacob. But part of loving is being honest and upfront with people. <laughs> Love one another. <clears throat> All right, we should be willing to be charitable and help people in need. 
help people in need, not necessarily help people who are foolish and stupid. I mean, there's, there's a, I'm not talking about Jacob in this case. Uh, there is a big difference. I mean, even sometimes when people are foolish and stupid, it's not wrong to help them, um, just to be merciful to them. Uh, but help people in need. All right? um, it's aggravating sometimes to hear people... Um, I'm not thinking about bus people necessarily, but it would apply there. But I mean, just people in a church, I hear them talking about how they, they don't have money for this or that. And, and they're holding a Starbucks. <laughs> and they're talking about where they went out to lunch yesterday. And I'm, <laughs> I feel bad that you don't have money to get new tires for your car. Uh, <laughs> why did you buy Starbucks? <laughs> you know, it's like, I, you know, there's lots of cases where just throwing money at somebody isn't really going to help them because they were foolish and they've, they've got to learn to be better. But, but God does tell us we should love. We should be willing to help. And there are lots of cases where that, uh, that is needed. Um, one other thought here with this, uh, we're commanded to love one another, is that people giving money privately is drastically different than public charity. And public charity really is it's an oxymoron. The government giving money out, that's described as public charity. Right. There's two different things completely. Me seeing somebody who's down in the luck and needs something and giving them money, that's vastly different than the government setting up a welfare system and giving people money and food that way. All right. Vastly different. Can anybody think of any, anything that would cause it to be different? When, it, when you give it privately. Yeah, if I walk up to you and you've had a bad day and your dog died, it sounds like a country music song, you know, your, your truck broke down, <laughs> you know, that stuff happened, um, and I help you get your truck fixed, then, then you know, you're, you see me. You, you, you're going to, you, you might be a little sheepish when I walk by the snack shop and you're buying food for all of your friends the next day. And I think, wait, why, just, why did I help you get your truck fixed? <laughs> um, there's some more accountability, and, and actually, that personal accountability is, is much more real than getting a check in the mail or a, a, a credit on your card. There's no face involved. There's no, <clears throat> there's no accountability. So very, very true. Also, um, that's good to do. Get, yeah, you get to pick where, where you put your money instead of just... Okay. Yeah, yeah. You 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 can help decide if somebody really is in need. All right. With a government program, really, all you have to do is you just have to qualify. Like that guy that had the disability that said he couldn't stay in one place for eight hours. All he got was some doctor to sign off on it, and he qualified. There's no need there, and you can probably think of lots of people that you know that have qualified for disability that aren't disabled at all, but they just happen to qualify. If you're personally giving them money. At some point, you can say, you know what? You can go get a job. <laughs> I'm not going to keep giving you money. It, uh, much more goes to the people in need. So. Is that what you're getting at? Okay. Yeah. To me, there's one other major difference between me giving my money to somebody, if I, if I give you a hint, I think it'll be obvious, and the government taking my money and giving it to somebody. If you give me something, you're stopping to. Okay. Uh, and the other one really isn't charity. It's like more like theft or something. The government comes to you by force and takes your money and gives it away. Right? Again, that's why I said public charity is kind of an oxymoron. It, it, the government's not giving away their own money. They're taking it from Mary and giving it to somebody else. It's a, it's a, a transfer of wealth, not, a, not charity. So if you listen to liberals, though, they'll talk about how we want to be generous and we want to help people. I think we, I gave you some stats about that between John Kerry and George Bush. So they, they love all these government programs but they're not going to personally help anybody. So it's drastically different. So here, this command to love, it's me commanded to love my fellow Christian and fellow, fellow, fellow person on the earth. It's a personal command. It's not a governmental command so, or a societal command. It's an individual command. All right, number 11, uh, God commands us to be honest. Okay, here we're thinking about uh, how we make choices. Hopefully we're honest in our choices. You know, Jacob was the guy defrauding people to make money. Uh, you shouldn't do that. So honesty, basic biblical principle that applies here. All right, another one, the Sabbath day or the, the, the six-day work week and a day of rest. That pattern uh, God set up. So the, the week as we think of it. 
Anybody remember what they did in the French Revolution? They tried to get rid of that pattern. Yeah, they tried a 10-day work week and it, it didn't work. It literally, didn't work. People couldn't function. They, they, they began to get exhausted and they, they, they had to go back to that. You might think at some point they might think, wow, maybe there is a God. <laughs> they, they didn't do that. Um, anyway, that, that, that pattern, the, the, the work week as we think of it, that is something God built. The work week, the, at least the six days and a day of rest, not necessarily the five days as we have it, but the, the work week. All right, so the Sabbath, the day of rest. Uh, number 13, uh, the Bible supports private property. Private property is a biblical idea. We hit upon this earlier, really. <clears throat> If there were in the, in the Bible, first and second, you know, government philosophy, uh, it'd be kind of handy for this purpose. But we can look at all kinds of places where there's just assumed. You know, the idea that we can't steal, we're not supposed to covet, et cetera, uh, implies that there's <laughs> private property. The, the, the ownership of the land uh, uh, with the Jews in, in the land of Israel, it was theirs personally. I mean, the king wasn't even supposed to come and take it. So private property. All right, number 14, uh, God is in control. So you think about the economy, God is in control, so we don't have to sit and wonder, you know, what's going to happen with the price of oil, um, or we don't have to sit and wonder about it, and ultimately it's in God's control, just like everything else is in God's control. And number 15, uh, the role of government is the same in the economy as it is just generally, all right? It's to stop evil and then allow the good to prosper, and really stopping the evil allows the good to prosper. I didn't stay and watch the volleyball game last night. Who won? The Hawks. Hawks. You're on the Hawks? Yep. Hawks? Mm -hmm. Who's on the losing team? Megan. <laughs> <laughs> kind of? <laughs> so that's a little, oh, uh, that's why Megan's sour today. <laughs> What was I getting at here? Oh, um, a, a sport event like that is, is, I think, a good example. The ref is there not to decide which team should win. All right, you know, oh, I like their uniforms. I'm going to make no. They're they're just there to call fouls, call carries, tell you when you slammed into the net and got thrown back on the floor or stepped across the line. Just, they're just to call the fouls. That's all. And in them doing that, it lets the best team win. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so. So anyway, economically, it's the same as its role generally. Punish evil and then praise the good or allow the good to prosper. I was thinking of um, another example. But I don't know what it was. Oh, I know, it wasn't an example. I didn't watch the volleyball game last night because I was home loving my fellow brother-in-law. We were doing his um, drum breaks. Gigantic pain in the neck. Uh, Frank could appreciate this. The brake line snaps. Both bill cylinders are leaking. It was a gigantic pain in the neck. Yeah, Sarah hates it. So, anyway, I was up there fulfilling another command of God, loving my brother-in-law. That's that's. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, sorry. All right. I'm happy to help him. Um, so, okay. Questions about uh, those biblical principles. Last class period, I just missed you guys 15 minutes early, I think. Really? Completely by accident. Uh, I, it's just a waste of time. And I know as stewards of our time and money, we don't want to waste it. <laughs> What's that? I'm sure. Is the <laughs> yeah, Victor. So... Well, I'm not going to dismiss you 20 minutes early today. <laughs> so, uh, let's look at economics in one lesson. I really, I didn't think that would take the whole class period, so I was really expecting to start into economics in one lesson, and then next class period we will, we will pick it up again. So maybe we can get down to the broken window uh, today. Okay, let me first of all state the lesson, or maybe I should ask you to state the lesson. The <laughs> two uh, you don't have to quote it verbatim. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll try. Um, I think it's like uh, an economic person, economist, yeah, needs to focus on all the groups involved and um, not just the immediate results. Okay.
Yeah, yes, all the groups and both the short and long-term effects. Perfect. Not only did she win her volleyball game, she's really smart. See that? You guys had a good day. So, all right, if you want the, the full thing, this is the way it's stated in the book. You don't necessarily have all the words. I'm not going to expect you to memorize this verbatim. Um, but this is it. The art of economics consists in not, this is on page 17 of my textbook. I just want to put, see page 17. Uh, the art of economics consists in not merely looking at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. So, short and long-term effects. And the, at the beginning, it does kind of go through history and point out different phases of history where they looked at just the short-term or looked at just the long-term. You gotta look at both. If you only look at the long-term effects of your decisions, you should save every penny you make for retirement. Because think how, how great retirement would be. <laughs> You starve to death and never make it there. But, and so you, you've got to look at both short and long-term effects. All right, and then the, the second half, it consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. All right, so short and long-term effects and all groups. That's somehow get that burned into your brain. <clears throat> short and long-term, all groups. Um, the... The, the biggest mistake, I, at least from my perspective, that we make today is not looking at all the groups. All right? uh, we, we, we see uh, somebody who's out of work, and they're, they're sitting right in that chair for some reason. They don't have a job. So the government says, well, let's, let's give them money. So they take money from all these people that are working and give it to them. And they say, look, we're better off because they have money. But they don't look at the people that lost money. They only look at that group. And it's a, it's, um, it's a very natural thing to do because you can see that person. You can see the new clothes they buy or the house they live in. You can see that stuff. It's much harder to hunt down the people whose money was taken and show that they don't have an extra set of clothes or whatever. It's much harder to find those people. This person is really easy to see. So it's, it's probably just natural to focus on that person. But really, we've got to step back and look at the whole picture. Short and long term, all groups. All right. Does that sound like a novel idea to anybody or a new Hopefully you're all thinking that sounds relatively familiar. Everybody there? Okay. This it should, hopefully, by this point, <laughs> be relatively familiar. Maybe I should revise all those quizzes and make you uh, state in your own words the, the lesson, every lesson, every quiz. You know, state the lesson, state the lesson, state the lesson. It wouldn't hurt. All right, let's talk about the broken window. In the very first chapter, does anybody remember the scenario? Sarah's on a roll here. <laughs> Good. I read it in this class, and it has stuck with me. Like, you want to go ahead? Making windows for his jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just sounds stupid on the, front, on the face of it, but that, the people, we get to that point. All right, uh, we get to that point. But let's, let's back it up. The, the story is, um, what's, the, uh, what's the, I thought I had it here. Was it a baker? Yeah. Yes. Baker has this nice window in the front and a hoodlum. I don't know who that is. Would that be somebody on the other team? Oh, yeah. Why do we assume it's a guy? I mean, what? <laughs> so unfair. <laughs> it's Megan. Megan's the hoodlum. Would that be a hoodlum, hoodlum, hoodlum et or hoodlum e or I had to get a feminine ending? What? A hoodlum et. A hoodlum et, right there. <laughs> hoodlum. <laughs> that sounds like a half a hoodie or something. Right? <laughs> so, all right, we're going the wrong direction here. This one who gets busted. And he first traces what happens if you don't apply the lesson. In this particular case, the, the, well, there are some short and long-term effects to think about, but the, 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 most, uh, the easiest thing to miss is all the groups. So he first traces what happens when the window's broken. The, the, the baker has to go to the glass, the glazier, I think he calls them, the glass maker, and give them a bunch of money <clears throat> to come and replace the window. And then that guy has a bunch of money and he goes to, uh, who wants to be the glass maker? I'm gonna share. <laughs> Bethany? Okay. And what do you do with all the money you got? Oh, I don't know. Waste it. <laughs> How do you waste it? I don't remember. Okay, let's, she ties. You know, no, just, 
whatever you want to do with this, fine. You don't have to follow the book in this case. <laughs> so, makeup, facial, pistol. pistol. Yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> AR-15, uh, uh, Beretta, 50 caliber. You know, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, makeup, chocolate. Nails, we're gonna get our nails done. Uh, uh, girls are weird. All right. <laughs> um, Starbucks. All right. The, the point is, we can see her get the money. We can see the money go other places, and you can say, "Wow, look! This has created economic stimulus. This is better for the economy." Okay. Now that that is. If you're sitting there getting convinced, that's a false picture, all right? Please, it's a false picture, all right? If we apply his lesson, and here particularly we're thinking about the second half, all the groups, all right? Who gets forgotten in that whole discussion of all this money being given to the glazier and then to the nail salon and to the Mary Kay lady and to the, uh, I just turned an advertisement this morning, smoke and guns in Illinois? They sell, to, they sell cigars and guns, <laughs> smoking guns. <laughs> we bought the gun, not the cigars, Frank. <laughs> all right. Uh, they, we can see them getting money. Who's getting forgotten in all of that? We're thinking about all the groups. The baker, all right. Whatever money she gets, he loses. So if you put up a ledger sheet, sorry, if you pull up Excel and you, <laughs> and you, you, you set up a, a spreadsheet there, uh, you're going to have plus... A thousand minus a thousand, there's no net gain. Right there. Right. And then the, the baker who lost his thousand dollars, he could have also gone to smoking guns and bought a, a pistol and a rifle. Uh, and hopefully he didn't get his nails done. <laughs> he bought his wife a pedicure and a manicure and her some make. He could have also bought all those things. All right. But we don't see those. Again, that's, where, that's why he stresses, you've got you to gotta think about all the groups. You can see the money flowing in the first case. But if you think about all the groups, there's really no gain. All right? In fact, there's a loss. We have a broken window. Right? <laughs> Instead of the baker having this nice window and the gun and all the other things, he just has the window. He just replaces the window. So we, have, we actually have a net loss. Whatever the value of the window is, we lose that as a society. Now, hopefully, we step back and think, well, obviously, some kid just threw a rock through a window. How do we not have a loss? <laughs> right? uh, but, it, but it's easy. I think that he starts with that lesson because it's fairly easy to see what happens if you don't think about all the groups. You can actually paint a picture where there's a gain there for society. Questions of the broken window? Um, think about, I think it's the next chapter, mass destruction. A war. How many remember in American history class me telling you that war is always listed as creating economic stimulus? Right. Oh, okay, I thought you were going to explain it. <laughs> uh, apply the broken window. A war is basically the, the broken window millions of times over. Instead of breaking one window, we're blowing the whole building up. <laughs> It's the same thing, but just on a grander scale, all right? If you look at the contractors who get, all the, get to build all the buildings, man, it's a heyday for them, right? But somebody else is losing, all right? The insurance companies, other, there's people losing. So there's no, no net gain. So that mass destruction, it really is just the broken window magnified to a larger scale. So, all right, uh, the broken window, what about the short and long-term effects? Is there anything especially significant there that we're missing? I really, in this case, I don't think so. In both cases, we, we look at the immediate effect and then the longer term effects. We're not forgetting one or the other necessarily, at least as we analyze it. You could, could possibly forget it. So. so the broken window is a good illustration here of the lesson. Um, mass destruction. Let's do one more. <clears throat> now let's go different. Let's talk about machines. Uh, just this morning, I was making a fire with the wood that I enjoy splitting so much when I'm making money off of it. Uh, I have to really focus because I, 
I don't get the newspaper, but um, the Amanjas on my bus route, they collect their <laughs> newspapers and give them to me. So, so I'm pulling out the newspaper to start my fire, and it's all fresh news for me. So I'm, I, I have to not read the articles to <laughs> start a fire. This morning there was an article about uh, robots, and it, it had a picture of this robot and said, meet the robot that's going to take your job or something like that. All right? And it had this little robot. It supposedly is the first robot that can pick up on emotion somehow. You know, if you look like you're sad, it'll recognize that. Um, um, what's that? Yeah, can you imagine opening your computer up and say, oh, it looks like you've had a bad day. So it's like, shut up. You know? <laughs> Just open word. <laughs> uh, but machinery, for, for going back to Adam Smith, you know, at the, in the late 1700s, people, and before that, people have talked about this new technology taking away jobs. Okay, let's try to analyze that uh, using his lesson. And let's, let's, let's talk about uh, a factory. Who wants to be the evil factory owner? You're on the good team. You can't be evil. All right, we have an evil factory owner. She's even got black on. You came prepared for this. <laughs> So does Mary. Is she like your manager or something? Uh, they're my minions. Your minions. Okay. There we go. All right. She owns this factory making... Oh. You don't know what you make? Gumballs. <laughs> Come on. Can they make pistols or something? It's a, it's a Springfield Armory factory. All right. Uh, she's making some product. Uh, uh, economists usually talk about making widgets. That's the, you know, when they don't know what to say they're making, they're making widgets of some kind. So you're making, you're making some product. And let's say she's got 100 employees. And uh, to, for her to make more money, because she loves money and is evil, she <laughs> finds some machinery that allows her to get rid of 80 employees and then keep 20 who will run the machinery. She's able to produce the gumballs for instead of 20 cents a gumball, she can produce them for 50 cents a gumball, or 15 cents a gumball, sorry. It's not <laughs> so it allows her to be more efficient and 80 people lose their job, okay? If we, apply, if we don't apply his lesson, and labor unions do this all the time as well as politicians, they'll talk about how the machines took away 80 jobs. All right, you can see those people. They'll stand outside the factory. You know, wear old, ragged clothes, and they'll bring their children along and paint their faces gray and ashen, and they'll stand there. And then, you know, then all the minions walk in, and they're smiling and happy. And it's easy for the media to look at this evil factory owner and how she cost all of these jobs. I think it's fun to have evil and she together. Usually it's guys that are evil, you know, like the, like the, the hood at there. Um, Let's apply Hazlitt's lesson to that. Go ahead. <laughs> Point out fallacies in that whole argument. Um, they're making more gumballs so people can buy more, <laughs> and it's cheaper, and so there's, people are saving money. Okay, we're forgetting about all the rest of the country, all of us gumball uh, addicts. <laughs> Right. Uh, instead of paying 20 cents for a gumball, we're paying 15 cents for a gumball. So after I, you know, uh, after I buy the cheaper gumballs, I have an extra $100 a month. Don't figure out how many gumballs I'm eating to save $100. <laughs> I've got an extra $100 a month, which then buys ammo for the gun that I just bought because <laughs> I, can, I can do other things because the product is cheaper. Okay? That's forgotten. All the people buying the product are forgotten. Okay? What else? Yeah, the machineries don't drop out of the sky ex nihilo. You know, God doesn't say, let there be a gumball machine, and poof, <laughs> there it is. Somebody's got to make that. So if she doesn't buy the machines, then those people lose their jobs. So you're evil no matter what you do. You might as well make money, okay? <laughs> so right, there's a whole group of people that make the machines that have jobs now. Okay, what else? Ah, she can, she can get rid of 80 employees, begin making the product cheaper, make more money, and then open a whole other plant and hire another 20 workers there. And if she's really good at this evil making money scheme, in the end, she'll have more people involved than initially. That would be a long-term effect. Okay. 
Uh, what about the machines themselves? Do they operate without any maintenance? What's that? Someone's got to repair them. Someone's got to maintain them. Someone's got to make the products to, to repair them. Think of, uh, think of the automobile industry and how many, how many uh, offshoots there are making parts for automobiles. <laughs> Someone's got to make parts for that thing. So there's a whole other f sea of people there that have jobs because she put the, the machines in. Okay? Labor unions and others forget that. So, um, Hazlett talked about the, the cotton spinning industry. And if you think back to the really old days where you had the wheel and you're, you're spinning the, the thread by hand to machines doing it and then the power looms and all that kind of stuff. Um, in 1760, according to his numbers, there was 7,900 people working in the textile industry. After all this machinery, uh, it would be 17 years later, there were 320,000 people working in the textile industry. Right? They're, they're, they weren't all sitting there making thread, right? But the, the new machinery allowed thread and fabrics to be so cheap that the demand exploded for it. You know, you know imagine if it was $100 for a shirt and just a cheap Walmart shirt. Now, I'm not going to have a whole closet full of them. I'm going to just have this, just a bare minimum. But if, if, the product, if the price drops to $10 a shirt, then man, you know, I don't like to iron. I'm just going to buy another shirt. Or get married. That's even cheaper. Well, I don't know if it's cheaper. It is better. <laughs> right. But the, the, the drop in the price of fabrics exploded that market. And there ends up being a 440% a 4, increase in the number of workers over a 27-year span in that tax honor. So imagine if the unions had stopped that, that development of those machines. Right. So the problem is that we don't, that is not looking at all of the groups and also not thinking of the long-term consequences. So uh, if you drop the price of your bubble gum, your gumballs, then there'll be more addicts all right, that, that have to have the gumballs. So. Oh, we forgot about the dental industry. How can we forget that? <laughs> so, so there we are. We're getting uh, creative here thinking about all the groups. <laughs> so. All right, next time we will pick back up with Hazlitt's uh, lesson, look at some more examples. There. But see you next week.